Hello and welcome to Natural Grocers Virtual Nutrition Education class. At Natural Grocers, one of our five founding principles is our dedication to providing nutrition education to the communities we serve, thereby empowering our customers and our employees to take charge of their lives and their health. Like all academic fields, nutrition science comprises a variety of viewpoints. Our speakers in classes reflect a variety of perspectives that do not necessarily reflect those of natural grocers. We encourage you to listen to different viewpoints, but most of all, listen to your body and decide what is best for you. The information presented at our events is for educational purposes only and is not intended to prevent, treat, mitigate, or diagnose any disease. Please remember that it should not be interpreted as medical or professional advice to replace that of your physician or healthcare professional. I am very pleased today to introduce Sally Fallon Morrell. She is founding president of the Weston A. Price Foundation and author of the best-selling book, Nourishing Traditions. Her other best-selling books are the Nourishing Traditions book of baby and child care, Nourishing Broth, Nourishing Fats, and Nourishing Diets. Sally has presented with Natural Grocers before and we are very pleased to have her back. And with that, I will turn it over to Sally for the presentation. Thank you so much, Janine. And I'm very happy to be back with uh, Natural Grocers and want to thank them for uh, letting um, various writers and speakers share their information. And so with that, we'll get started. This is a, a fairly long presentation. I'm going to try to shrink it into 45 minutes, so I may go quickly. At the end, I'll give you a link where you can find a more detailed version of this presentation. So nourishing traditional diets, the key to vibrant health. And I also have a disclaimer, this presentation is not intended as a substitute for, for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. It's for educational purposes only. I bet a lot of you are asking, what is a healthy diet? There is so much confusing and conflicting information out there about how we should eat. Is it Should we eat a carnivore, keto, or Atkins type diet based largely on meat? Uh, or should we go towards a vegetarian and vegan diet about which a lot of claims are made? Or uh, all of, you know, we have all of these various dietary schemes, uh, which are touted as um, a way to find good health. Even Lisa, who's a very smart little girl, even Lisa is confused. Then we have the official government diet, which was formulated in 1984 to help Americans curb their weight and uh, stay free of disease. And it was based on a pyramid, and the basis of this diet was carbohydrate foods. This pyramid basically gave the Americans the green light to eat all the carbohydrates they want, wanted, but made them afraid to eat fats. And this has been a complete failure. Uh, obesity rates have increased 30% since this food pyramid was put out. And of course, this is how most people <laughs> think they should eat. Uh, uh, and basically what the dietary guidelines did was make it clear that quality didn't count, that it was just macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And, you know, if they were processed, that was fine uh, uh, as well. To answer the question, what is a healthy diet? We need to go to the work of Weston Price, who wrote this wonderful book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Uh, Dr. Price was a dentist and he spent 10 years traveling all over the world studying uh, isolated so-called primitive people. And since he was a dentist, he uh, first of all looked at their teeth. And we're just going to go very briefly into what he found. He found 14 primitive groups that were completely free from chronic disease, infectious disease. And most importantly, they had beautiful facial structure, high, high wide cheekbones, and naturally straight teeth, plenty of room in the dental palates uh, for the teeth to come in straight. And they had no cavities. And they were also free of uh, other types of disease. He found 14 groups that had this pattern. Um, as soon as the P 
people started eating processed foods, the white man's foods. Um, the, the next gen, well, the first generation had terrible tooth decay, but the next generation was born with altered facial structure. The face became more narrow, the body more narrow and less robust, more prone to disease, and the teeth came in crooked. So this is the number one sign that we can see uh, of whether or not the diet during the formation of the body and the growth of the body was a good diet. And obviously this was not a good diet. Same with the South Seas. Um, again, these are just fantastic photographs of what it means to be healthy, what it looks like to be healthy. And that has to start with a good diet even before conception. The, the pattern he saw was always the same. Uh, those who began eating processed foods soon developed rampant tooth decay, causing a lot of pain and suffering. And the next generation, the facial structure was altered. The teeth were crowded and crooked. The, the um, face was more narrow and uh, they became much more prone to modern diseases, especially tuberculosis. So we like to say that the teeth tell the tale. When you see a person with naturally straight teeth and a wide face, it means that there has been really good nutrition for the whole body during growth and development. That means there'll be plenty of room in the head for the uh, all the important uh, glands in the head, the sinus cavities and the ear tubes will be spacious and so less um, uh, prone to illness and infection. You'll see good skeletal development, good musculature, good posture, keen eyesight and hearing, optimal function of all the organs, and an optimistic outlook, uh, easy learning, good memories. And most interesting, when the teeth are naturally straight and the face is broad, the pelvic opening will be round, and that is the shape most important for easy childbirth. So childbirth uh, in these groups was uh, basically painless. When you see an individual with a more narrow face and crowded and crooked teeth, uh, that means there's going to be compromise in the whole body, starting with the glands in the head. You tend to see poor development, poor posture, easy, you know, easy to be injured. Uh, eyesight is one of the first things to go. So poor eyesight and hearing compromised function of all the organs. And then of course, what is epidemic today, depression, behavior problems and learning problems. And finally, the pelvic opening will not be round, it will be oval. And that is a very difficult shape for childbirth. So childbirth suddenly becomes painful and even life-threatening. Uh, this photograph perfectly illustrates the difference between what I would call a well-developed face on the right that is normal facial development. And what I would call a modern face on the left, um, where you can see that there's been a narrowing of the facial structure and not enough room in the dental palate for the teeth to come in straight. So just uh, recapitulating here, when we ask this question, what is a healthy diet? Uh, it is The answer has to be, it is a diet that produces healthy, well-formed children generation after generation. Well, Dr. Price formulated several principles about what constituted a healthy diet. And the first principle was, there were no refined or denatured foods in these diets. Um, the list was rather short in Dr. Price's day. Uh, the list of refined ingredients, it includes sugar, white flour, canned foods, condensed milk. Um, I particularly want to emphasize the vegetable oils the industrial seed oils, these were completely new to the diet in his day and had never been in the human diet before. And they replaced the animal fats that were so prized in these cultures. The list is much longer today. We not only have refined sugar, but we have its evil twin, high fructose corn syrup. And uh, agave uh, syrup is made just like high fructose corn syrup. It's uh, very similar. White flour is basically the basis of the Western diet. Pasteurized milk and skim and low-fat milk are not whole foods. They're foods in which valuable components have been taken out or destroyed. And then we have all types of refined vegetable oils, hydrogenated oils, refined vegetable oils. And these are in just about 100% of all processed foods. I'm particularly concerned about protein powders. These have a very specific danger 
uh, for human beings. And we hopefully will have time to go into that. And then of course, all the additives and artificial sweeteners in our diet. So it's quite a list. And uh, the only way to um, re re uh, avoid them is to um, cook your own food and know exactly what's in it. Dr. F uh, Price's most famous saying was, life in its fullness is mother nature obeyed. And he, it was a very unique outlook in his day because this was the time when science was coming to the fore and we were gonna have a full life by following science, not by obeying mother nature, <laughs> okay? Uh, but I do want to emphasize that factory foods are not mother nature's foods. The second principle was that every diet contained animal products. Dr. Price had hoped to find a healthy group of people who were not eating animal foods. And he had to admit that not only were all of these cultures eating animal foods, but these animal foods were considered the most important foods for having healthy children. So fish and shellfish, and Dr. Price found that those who had fish and shellfish in their diet had the best bone structure of any of the groups. Birds, uh, chicken, ducks, geese, etc., uh, and especially including the organs, the fat, and the skin. There's no, no skinless chicken breast here. They were eating the whole animal. Red meat in many diets, beef, goat, sheep, game, again with the organ meats and fat preferred when the hunting was good, the muscle meats were thrown away. Uh, they wanted the really nutrient-dense parts of the animals, which was the organ meats, and they would not eat an animal that didn't have enough fat on it. <clears throat> Uh, milk and milk products were raw or cultured, never pasteurized. Eggs from birds that are outside eating their natural diet. Reptiles and insects are not in our diet. I'm not going to tell you you have to eat these foods, but they were very important foods in traditional cultures. Uh, there are certain nutrients that we can only get in animal foods, uh, vitamins, vitamins A and D, and we'll talk about those in more detail. Uh, cholesterol, now I hear you saying to yourselves, well, we can make all the cholesterol we need, but that's not true of babies and children. Uh, babies and children uh, need to have cholesterol in their diet. They actually can't make it. And cholesterol is absolutely essential for building a healthy brain, nervous system, for building a healthy gut, or, uh, really for the whole body, for all the developmental hormones. And um, one of the greatest tragedies in our culture today is that we are trying to raise children on low-fat diets or just fruit or rice cereal or whatever. And um, these babies need lots of cholesterol. That's why we say the first foods for babies should be egg yolks and liver, two of the highest cholesterol foods. B12, we, we know we only get in animal foods and certain types of fats I won't go into details, but we find these in animal fats and uh, fish fats. And there's many nutrients that are more easily absorbed from animal products. Calcium, for example, really the only two good sources of calcium in traditional diets were dairy products or bones. And cultures that did not have dairy products crushed up the bones of small animals and added them uh, to their food. B6, magnesium, iron, zinc, and copper, again, uh, these are very, it's very difficult to get adequate amounts from plant foods, especially zinc, which is involved in a, over 100 enzymatic reactions and is critical for reproduction. And again, uh, B12 deficiency is a very serious thing, and it actually manifests as um, neurological disorders, psychiatric disorders. And I, I can't stress enough that I, I know there's this big push to get people on what they call plant-based diets, vegetarian diets, vegan diets. Uh, but the studies of people on these diets are not very encouraging. And one in, in particular in 2014, they found that those who were trying to follow a vegetarian or vegan diet had more cancer, more allergies, more mental illness. There's your B12 deficiency. They needed more health care, they had a poorer quality of life, and they had far more tooth decay. In fact, tooth decay is often one of the first things that shows up in people trying to avoid the animal products. Uh, the third principle was the principle of nutrient density. This is Dr. Price's key finding. 
he analyzed the foods they ate in his laboratory uh, back in the States. And he found that these diets were very high in minerals, calcium and other minerals, everything from magnesium to iodine. But even more striking was that they were 10 times higher in the fat-soluble vitamins compared to the modern American diet. Now, these fat-soluble vitamins are the vitamins that are found in organ meats and animal fats. Uh, so we find these... Uh, there were three fat-soluble vitamins, and the first two we'll talk about are A and D, and they are found in certain seafoods, uh, fish eggs, fish livers, fish liver oil. This is one of the reasons we're very um, supportive of using cod liver oil, the old-fashioned remedy, especially for growing children so they get adequate amounts of A and D. Um, fish heads, which we don't eat, but very important food in um, Asian diets. Uh, shellfish, oily fish, and sea mammals like seal. And the land animals, uh, insects. No, I'm not telling you you have to eat insects. Uh, butter and cream, egg yolks, liver, organ meats, and animal fats. All the foods they're telling us not to eat were the foods considered absolutely essential for good health among these primitive communities and very important for healthy children. Dr. Price called these vitamins activators because you need them for using minerals. He says it is possible to starve for minerals that are there. They're abundant in the foods eaten because they cannot be utilized without an adequate quantity of the fat-soluble activators. So we look on the body as a house or temple uh, built of bricks and mortar, and the bricks are the minerals, and the mortar is the fat-soluble activators, A and D. So... You can be eating mineral-rich foods, uh, make, putting a big emphasis on mineral-rich foods, but unless you're getting the animal fats with them, uh, they will go to waste. And not to get into too much detail, but everyone thinks that there's vitamin A in plant foods. Uh, the truth is that there's no vitamin A in plant foods. What's in the plant foods are carotenes. Uh, we can... Um, convert some of those carotenes into vitamin A, but we don't do it very well. And about 50% of all humans actually lack the enzyme to make this conversion. We need to get our vitamin A, our true uh, animal form of vitamin A from animals who spend their whole lives making this conversion. And then the myth about vitamin D is that all you need to do is go out in the sun and and uh, in the daylight, and you'll get all the vitamin D you need. And this is a myth also. We certainly can't do this in the winter, for example. And traditional cultures actually went into the shade when the sun was shining too brightly. So, so they went into the shade when the sun was shining too brightly. Uh, uh, they got their vitamin D from foods. So where do we get these critical vitamins, A and D? Where did we get them in the traditional American diet? Uh, we got them from liver and other organ meats. Uh, we got them from liver and other organ meats. Um, <clears throat> uh, and up until the Second World War, Americans did eat liver at least once a week because the doctors told them to. And the liver was uh, hidden and things like uh, sausage, pate, liverwurst, and scrapple. Uh, we took cod liver oil, and Americans ate lots and lots of butter and eggs and cheese and cream. Uh, we recognize these as good, healthy foods. And, and our animals were outside on pasture, so that maximized the amount of these vitamins in the food. And we cooked in lard. And, of course, lard has been completely demonized, but... Um, lard is an extremely healthy fat, it's a very stable fat, and it's an excellent source of vitamin D. So when we were cooking in lard, we had vitamin D in our diets every day. An old ad about a lard, they're happy because they eat lard, and this is very true because the vitamin D in lard helps the body make neurochemicals that protect us against depression. Finally, the third fat-soluble vitamin was vitamin K2. Dr. Price wasn't sure what it was. He called it Activator X. And animals get this from eating green grass or plankton in the sea. And it's a really critical 
vitamin for the formation of the body for bone development, for protecting the bones and teeth. It also uh, protects us against heart disease. Basically what vitamin K does is put the calcium and phosphorus in the bones and teeth where it belongs and prevents the body from putting it in the arteries and the soft tissues where it doesn't belong. These three vitamins work together. A and D are signaling vitamins that tell the cells to make certain proteins. And then vitamin K activates these proteins after the signaling by vitamins A and D. So you need them all together. And this is why we warn very strongly against taking these separately as um, vitamin pills. You know, there's a big push to take lots and lots of vitamin D. Uh, but if you're not getting the A and K with it, that D can be toxic. So the nice thing about getting these vitamins from food is that the foods that contain these vitamins are just delicious and very satisfying and make eating really fun. Like the foods that are really rich in vitamin K include goose liver, duck liver, goose fat and duck fat. Probably the best source in the American diet is aged cheeses. Everybody loves cheese. And then again, egg yolks, butter, lard, chicken liver, fatty meats, all wonderful, uh, satisfying foods. And it is formed by fermentation, so there might be a little bit in sauerkraut. Grass pasture-based agriculture is one of our big themes. Let's get these animals out of the feedlots, back onto uh, pasture. Um, what happens when animals are eating green grass in the sunlight is they produce and store these fat-soluble vitamins in their fat. Um, in the butter fat of the cows and in the organ meats. And I like to say the cow is a sacred animal. She is working all the time to produce these vitamins and store them uh, for our benefit. Again, the pastured poultry model, we want these hens to be outside getting plenty of vitamin D, eating bugs, eating grass. You will turn the carotenes and the K1 and the grass into true vitamin A and the vitamin K2, which is what the human being needs. And we did some preliminary studies and found eight times more D and two times more A in a pastured egg compared to the supermarket egg. Uh, unfortunately, our agricultural system aims at being efficient and producing cheap food. And we are all beginning to learn that there's a very high price for cheap food. And it's also a very cruel type of uh, agriculture. I, I do want to stress that the brain is an organ, just like um, all the organs in the body, and it needs to be nourished. And the key nutrients for brain development come from these very foods we're talking about, eggs, butter, seafood, meats, organ meats, um, animal fats, and cod liver oil. So these nutrients are A, D, and K critical for neurological development. Choline is uh, very important for making connections in the brain. A liver and egg yolks are the best source of uh, choline, and this is what we recommend as the first foods for babies. Uh, DHA, uh, zinc, and cholesterol, again, from these nutrient-dense foods. Not hard to get kids to take cod liver oil uh, if you start them out young. <laughs> um, um, these are my grandsons, and they would uh, get their cod liver oil and then grab the syringe so uh, they could lick the rest of it off. And uh, cheese is a wonderful food. It's a complete food. If you were stranded on a desert island and had nothing else to eat, if you had cheese, you would make it because every nutrient that you need is in cheese, especially raw cheese. Everything from calcium and all the minerals to all the vitamins and even vitamin C. And cheese is a probiotic food. It has more diverse types of beneficial organisms and more of them uh, quantitatively than yogurt. So the six basic good fats and oils that you should all have in your kitchen, butter, of course, lard uh, for cooking, olive oil for your salads, uh, coconut oil is a very healthy fat, uh, uh, duck fat, again, um, wonderful source of vitamin K. So have some duck fat on hand to cook your potatoes in. The cod liver oil for making sure you have enough A and D in your diet. 
Uh, we definitely recommend shellfish. Um, not so easy in Colorado, but um, um, areas that were near the sea that Dr. Price studied, they had the best bone structure. So one way or another, you do want to get shellfish into your diet. Liver, there's lots of ways to eat liver. Um, liver and onions, uh, liverwurst, uh, pate is the European way of eating liver. I say it's a way of making awful taste good. <laughs> uh, in sausage and mix in meatloaf, meatballs, etc. Or you, if you can't handle any of this, some desiccated liver tablets because liver is the most nutrient dense food in the human diet. There's no food higher in nutrients than liver. Uh, let's just look at um, iron, for example. And the iron in liver is a very absorbable, healthy type of iron. And you can see how much higher it is in than red meat or in uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, even vitamin C, if you'll go down to vitamin C, uh, there's more vitamin C in liver than there is in the apples or the carrots. And look at B12 and B6, two really critical nutrients. I often say if you are on a budget and you can only afford to uh, eat meat once a week, if you eat liver, uh, you will be getting as much B12 and B6 as eating red meat for every meal. Fish eggs were another very important food in traditional diets. Dr. Price took this photograph, little girls holding some dried fish eggs and she's 12,000 miles up in the Andes. They dried the fish eggs and took it up in their backpacks uh, to make sure that they had this uh, healthy food. And they told Dr. Price they needed this, these fish eggs so they could have healthy babies. So indulge every now and then, have a little uh, bit of caviar. Salmon caviar is relatively inexpensive. And we did a test which found 17,000 IUs of vitamin D in just one tablespoon of caviar. That's why it makes you feel so good. Um, switching gears a little bit, some of the other uh, principles of traditional healthy diets. One was when we eat meat, we're just getting the muscle part of the animal, but um, we also want to get the collagen from the animal to nourish our own collagen. And so when we um, cook the bones and the skin and the tendons and so forth of a chicken or of um, beef or whatever, <clears throat> we're basically getting melted collagen. And this is a wonderful food uh, for our health. As a proverb, good broth resurrects the dead. Uh, these bone broths uh, supply minerals. They help us build healthy cartilage and collagen. The amino acids in bone broth are very detoxifying. Uh, the gelatin in bone broth helps digestion. Bone broth support gut health. They can actually heal the gut. And the glycine in broth helps regulate our mood, helps us produce feel-good chemicals. No wonder uh, we feel good after a bowl of chicken soup. It really, it should be real bone broth and not a uh, fake, you know, made with chemicals. So we say just say no to industrial food-like substances. Uh, the worst offenders are, of one, number one, um, industrial fats and oils, high fructose corn syrup, MSG, which is the artificial flavoring, which is quite toxic to the nervous system and also associated with weight gain, artificial sweeteners, uh, modern soy foods, breakfast cereals, and pasteurized and homogenized milk. So. One by one, you want to try to get these out of your diet. Uh, we start with the bad fats. Go through your cupboards and refrigerator and just get rid of these bad fats, starting with the margarines and spreads. And I don't care if these are so-called healthy spreads that reduce cholesterol. Um, you know, we make um, sex hormones out of cholesterol. You really want to uh, reduce your cholesterol so you can't make estrogen and testosterone. So they, they really are quite toxic, these spreads. And then learn to make your own salad dressing using olive oil. Uh, instead of using these very toxic cooking oils, um, cook in lard and butter. And then, of course, all of the foods um, made out of these oils, especially the partially hydrogenated oils. Um, these, these are what's killing us. This is the number one source of disease in the Western diet. 
So the liquid polyunsaturated oils are rancid. They have a lot of free radicals and they cause uncontrolled reactions in the body. The solid partially hydrogenated oils actually inhibit reactions. They inhibit enzymes in the body. And when you're eating a diet that is based on these fats and oils, the result is biochemical chaos on the cellular level. Who knows what it'll be? Premature aging, cancer, heart disease, um, neurological problems, behavior problems. It could be any of these uh, if this is what's what your diet is based on. <clears throat> we do warn against soy foods. Uh, soy foods are imitation foods, first of all. Uh, they go through horrendous processing, lots of chemicals. They are extremely difficult to digest, and most seriously, they are very high in estrogens, estrogen-like compounds that not only cause endocrine disruption, but also disrupt thyroid uh, your thyroid function. And we have been working with uh, prisoners in many prisons. The diets are almost 100% soy, and the health problems that result from this kind of diet are just horrendous. Um, Everything from not being able to function because your thyroid gland is destroyed or breast development in the men uh, from eating these estrogenic foods. So they're, they block minerals, they block protein digestion, they block thyroid function, they cause endocrine disruption, they irritate the digestive tract, and they can cause brain injury, and they're very high in oxalates and can cause kidney stones. Uh, breakfast cereals are made by a process called extrusion, and in studies that were never published, uh, it was found that animals given um, cornflakes made by extrusion died sooner than the animals given the box that the cornflakes came in. And it, what happened was the uh, the nervous uh, the nerves in the uh, digestive tract became poisoned and the animals died of seizures and uh, fits and, um, and this kind of thing. And of course, we have a population of now several generations of children growing up on these uh, breakfast foods, these cereals, and you're seeing exactly what can predi be predicted from these animal studies. They, they can't sit still, they can't concentrate. It's as though the nervous system is poisoned. Uh, MSG is in pretty much all processed food. It's often uh, hidden. It's not um, uh, labeled as MSG, but it's there. It's been linked to diabetes, migraines and headaches, obesity. The way they get um, animals fat to in a laboratory to study obesity is they feed them MSG, and that makes them fat. And then neurological problems like autism, ADHD, and Alzheimer's. Um, it uh, comes in many guises, um, hide, anything hydrolyzed, the casein, the extracts, the yeast extract, flavors, natural flavors, um, all of these are likely to contain MSG. So I'm not saying, you know, never buy, let's see, never buy ketchup or, you know, uh, seasonings or whatever, but look, read the labels. I'm sure that Natural Grocers has um, good forms of these types of foods. And this is from a wonderful book, Excitotoxins. Uh, well, I say wonderful, but actually kind of scary book because it shows what happens to your nerve cells when they're exposed to MSG. And this, uh, this is when they get past the blood-brain barrier, and this is very likely <clears throat> in children and the elderly. <coughs> What we've learned in the last, <coughs> excuse me, in the last 20 years is that bacteria are not the enemy. They are our friends. And we actually need about six pounds of healthy bacteria in our intestinal tract to digest our food and to be healthy. So we've seen a real paradigm shift. And we now know that these bacteria uh, help digest our food. They uh, create nutrients. They are our number one protection against toxins, and they produce feel-good chemicals. So without good bacteria, we are dead. And the way we honor our 
gut bacteria is to eat lacto-fermented foods. Every single culture in the world consumed these raw fermented foods, and they were basically getting their probiotics every day. The good bacteria do get through the stomach and into the small intestine where they do their wonderful work. So you want to have a little bit of fermented food every day, and I'm sure you can get the natural sauerkraut and so forth at natural grocers. Also, the fermented beverages. One of the uh, most beneficial and good things that's happened in the last 10 years is the um, um, onset of being able to buy fermented beverages like kombucha. Make sure that they're really raw fermented and not too high in sugar. Uh, we are the raw milk people. We have a website, realmilk.com, where you can find raw milk. And raw milk is just a wonderful food. Just I'll just point out one thing, glutathione. Raw milk is our best source of glutathione. It's destroyed by heat. And we live in a toxic world. And glutathione is our best protection against toxins. In children, it protects against asthma, allergies, and eczema, and builds an immune system, builds a healthy gut wall, and provides very assimilable calcium for optimal growth, strong bones, and strong teeth. Just, just one study here. These rats, the ones on pasteurized milk on the bottom photograph, were scrawny. They were hairless um, due to vitamin. They had hairless patches due to vitamin B6 deficiency. And the bones were far less dense um, the pasteurized, on the pasteurized milk. So this is all when we're building our bones, building the bones and teeth in our children, uh, you're going to get much better bone structure if they are fed raw milk. Raw milk cheese will, will also work. Um, this study showed what happens to that calcium when it doesn't go to the bones. The guinea pigs on raw milk had excellent growth, no abnormalities on pasteurized milk. The calcium was streaked in the soft tissues uh, where it doesn't belong. So the form of calcium and phosphorus in raw milk is used by the body properly and efficiently to build strong bones and strong teeth. And this is my favorite study. These are the rat studies. These were done at Ohio State University, 1931. Those on whole raw milk had good growth, sleek coats, clear eyes, and they were nice little rats. They enjoyed being picked up and petted by the researchers. Um, they weren't stressed by that. Whereas those on pasteurized milk uh, were uh, unhealthy. They were anemic, um, loss of vitality and weight, and they were not very nice little rats. They were irritable and often tended to bite when they were picked up by the researchers. And one of the most common testimonials that we get from parents, when they just make one change in the diet of their children, they switch from pasteurized to raw milk, is an improvement in the children's behavior. The children settle down, they do better in school, they sleep better. Um, I've had parents say, you know, I didn't realize what great kids I had until we put them on raw milk. And again, the glutathione in raw milk is a key component for detoxification. What about grains? We have a lot of groups out there that are telling us not to eat grains and the grains are toxic. But the truth is that many, many traditional cultures had grains and they were perfectly healthy. The difference is um, that they knew how to prepare these grains. They grains were soaked, sprouted, fermented, or naturally leavened, as in the sourdough bread, because grains are very difficult to digest. They are deliberately difficult to digest. Um, they often go straight through you. Uh, a seed will just go straight through uh, because they have a lot of what we call anti nutrients that block digestion, block mineral absorption, or are very irritating or impossible to digest. But the proper preparation of these foods liberates all the nutrients, um, gets rid of the irritants, and the foods then become a wonderful source of nutrition for us. The herbivore, the animal that lives on grains and grasses, has a complex stomach with anywhere from two to uh, four chambers, uh, and at least one of these will act as a fermentation tank to ferment these grains. 
on the inside. We don't, we don't have that. We have a simple stomach. We don't have a fermentation tank in our bodies. So we have to do this fermentation on the outside. And all traditional cultures understood this principle. So the proper preparation of seed foods imitates the natural factors that neutralize all these preservatives and allow the seed to sprout. They are moisture, warmth, slight acidity, and time. Here's a beautiful example of what they call the Cherokee bread. Uh, the cooked cornmeal was wrapped in a corn husk and put aside for two weeks to allow to, it to ferment. And then they made their tamales and tortillas and everything uh, with the fermented corn. Um, here's something that you can do. You, um, uh, this is for oatmeal. Oatmeal should always be cooked. Oatmeal is uh, all, always be soaked, excuse me. It should always be soaked and cooked. Uh, otherwise, it's extremely difficult to digest. So the night before, you soak the oatmeal in warm water with a tablespoon or two of something acidic, whey, yogurt, vinegar, or lemon juice. And you leave that on the counter in your warm kitchen overnight. So there you have the moisture, warmth, slight acidity, and time. And while you're fast asleep with your simple stomach, all the little gremlins, enzymes, and good bacteria are preparing those oats for you so that you can digest them. And the next morning, you bring some water to a boil, you add some salt, and you cook those oats until they're nice and soft. And then you can really enjoy your oatmeal with maybe some nuts or coconut, a sweetener, a natural sweetener like maple syrup, honey, or rapadura, or maple sugar. And you want to have a good animal fat on there. You've liberated all the minerals, but they're not going to be um, absorbed unless you have your A and D from the animal fat. So cream or butter. And I always get a lot of laughs when I say I put a half a stick of butter on my oatmeal every morning. And that's, that's the truth. <laughs> and then oatmeal is a really nourishing meal and a very economical one as well. Breakfast is an important meal. Here's some examples of good breakfast. We have scrambled eggs with extra yolks in them, uh, potatoes sauteed in lard or bacon fat. That's, that's a delicious, uh, good bre breakfast. Uh, smoothies, um, again, you want to make them with, so they have a lot of fat in them, whole yogurt, egg yolks, fruit, and coconut oil. And here we have fried eggs with no nitrate bacon and some fruit. This is what I call a cruel breakfast, extruded rice cereal, impossible to digest, toxic to the nervous system, skim milk, so no fat, and then your orange juice, which is going to be just loaded with pesticides and kind of acts like naked sugar. More cruel breakfast, basically just stimulants and um, white flour and sugar. These are diabetes starter kits. And these are not appropriate breakfasts for you and your family. We say get to know sourdough. Our diet, uh, the wise traditions diet, as we call it, does not exclude grains, but the grains really do need to be prepared properly. And sourdough bread, genuine sourdough bread, it is a long, slow fermentation, is a good and healthy food for you. And that's how you eat your bread. You want to see teeth marks in the butter <laughs> because the butter is a very important factor for digesting the grains, uh, the animal fats are. Uh, don't forget salt. Uh, salt is a really critical. Uh, we can't live without salt. And one of the good things about the modern diet is everybody has plenty of salt. Uh, in the past, if you didn't get salt for one reason or another, um, it was um, catastrophic and people just died of um, salt deprivation. So we need salt for digestion, protein and carbohydrate digestion. For example, the chlorine in salt is what we need for making hydrochloric acid, and without salt, we cannot digest proteins. And the sodium part of salt is needed for activating enzymes to break down carbohydrates. So without salt, we can't digest carbohydrates. There's a reason we have salt uh, taste buds in our mouth, and the creator didn't put them there to torture us, but he uh, put them there, or he or she put them there, so we put salt on our food. Uh, it's uh, critical for brain development. Babies and children need salt, and it needs to be added to their food. Nursing moms need to eat a lot of salt. Uh, one of the terrible things we do is tell moms uh, not to put salt in baby's food. 
uh, adrenal function and cellular metabolism. Again, all uh, highly dependent on having plenty of salt in the diet. Uh, but we don't want to refine our salt. We want to leave all the minerals there. And I'm sure that Natural Grocers has many uh, choices of unrefined salt for you. Your salt should be gray, pink, or beige, indicating the presence of minerals. We need a, a teaspoon and a half of salt per day. And the interesting thing is that teaspoon and a half of unrefined refined salt will provide 800 milligrams of magnesium. That's twice the RDA for magnesium. So that's a way to ensure that you're getting the magnesium you need. Anyone get tired? <laughs> When, I'm, uh, when I can see my audience, uh, a lot of hands go up. Fatigue is very, very common. So how do you deal with fatigue? You deal with it by making digestion easy. Um, the more you can spare the, uh, your digestion, the more energy that you will have. So that means raw dairy, which is very easy to digest, not pasteurized, which is extremely difficult to digest, Proper preparation of grains, so you're pre-digesting those grains. Lacto-fermented foods, rich in enzymes and beneficial bacteria, and the gelatin-rich bone broth. And I guarantee you, if you get these, start doing these things in your diet, you will be amazed at how much more energy you have. So this is how we're told to eat. Um, this is the dietary guidelines. Um, um, you know, lots of whole grains, but not properly prepared. So very rough diet, um, very little animal foods, maybe a little bit of oil, tiny bit of cheese. But um, I, I call this a puritanical diet. It's a virtuous plant-based, low-fat, low-salt, high-fiber diet approved by dietitians and impossible to stay on. You eventually, in fact, even within a few days, you develop cravings. And what this puritanical diet does is drive you right into the, uh, oh, excuse me. This is another um, example of the puritanical diet, just meat and vegetables, no fats, no grains, no carbs. And what these diets do is drive you right into the arms of the pornographic foods. So we don't want to be either way. We don't want to be puritanical diet or the pornographic diet. We want to do the middle way, which is good old-fashioned, rich, satisfying, tasty foods, the foods of our ancestors. These are health foods, uh, especially if the plant foods and the animal foods are carefully grown in a non-toxic way. So we like to say that on the Wise Traditions diet, there's no deprivation. You can have it all. <laughs> Uh, just be careful where the foods come from and how they're prepared. So you can have meat, you can have sauces and gravy made with genuine bone broth. Uh, you can have bacon and eggs, seafood, lots of butter. You can have butter on everything. You can eat salt and grains, milk and cheese, pickles, vegetable soup. Even sweets have a place in a healthy diet. A moderate amount of sweets made with natural sweeteners. And soft drinks like kombucha. So it's all there for you. It's just a question of choosing properly and preparing properly. I wanted to share this photograph. This is a Wise Traditions baby. Uh, parents um, ate this way, or the mom ate this way while pregnant. The parents ate this way before she became pregnant. Uh, she ate this way while she was nursing. And then the first foods for this beautiful baby, look at his round face. He will not need braces. He's big and healthy and strong. Um, uh, the first foods were egg yolks and liver. So the Weston A. Price Foundation is there for you to provide you with information you need. We have no ties with industry, no ties with the government, so we can tell the truth. We are an educational foundation. Our members receive our quarterly magazine. I hope you will think about joining. We have a lot of informational brochures. We publish a yearly shopping guide. We have an annual conference, and yes, we are having a live conference this year in November in Atlanta, and uh, we have local chapters all over the world to help you find the healthy foods that we're talking about. We have a huge website. Please have a look. Uh, you can find your local chapter there. Um, 
you can, there's a beginner's tour. I know it might seem kind of overwhelming when you first go there because there's so much on this website. We publish a yearly shopping guide that's uh, updated yearly and members receive this shopping guide. So if you become a member, uh, you will receive our shopping guide. It's also available as an app that you can use on your phone or on your computer. So a lot of our members don't like to use their cell phones. Uh, so this app is also available for your computer. Uh, we have a colorful uh, short book on our dietary guidelines uh, with recipes. Very good for beginners. We have special issues, the healthy baby issue, the heart disease issue. We have a wonderful podcast. We're just coming on 3 million downloads on our podcast and people just love this podcast. And then turning to my books, in addition to Nourishing Traditions, I have the book on baby and child care and a cookbook for children. Uh, my three nourishing books, Nourishing Broth, Nourishing Fats, and Nourishing Diets. I have a DVD series. And my latest book, The Contagion Myth, which talks about coronavirus and um, um, presents this um, um, radical idea that there's no such thing as contagion. What makes us sick is nutrient deficiencies, toxins, or injury. And this book has been banned on Amazon. They would not uh, carry it, but it is available in many places, including Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, uh, and Target. Dr. Price's work is, is available on Amazon and uh, many other booksellers. So uh, just to um, summarize, everything they did in traditional diets was aimed at maximizing the nutrients in their food, starting with the way they did their agriculture, their preference for organ meats, the use of animal fats, uh, the way they prepared their um, grains and legumes, the use of bone broths, unrefined foods, lacto-fermented foods, unrefined salt, uh, wonderful nutrients in the salt, and the way they cook their food. Everything we do in the modern diet is aimed at minimizing the nutrients in our food and making the foods more convenient, have a long shelf life. We like to say long shelf life, short human life. Finally, um, this uh, PowerPoint presentation is available at uh, westonaprice.org. And I should have put it here. It's also available at my website, which is nourishingtraditions.com. A longer version is available under resources. Thank you so much, Sally. That was so great, so informative. I did have a question I just wanted to ask you. It seems like people would be wondering, so with this diet, is it people will think, well, this will make me gain weight um, since we are exercise so much less than non-industrial people. Um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Okay, I get this question a lot. Um, well, I can't eat all these fats, they'll make me gain weight. Yeah. And usually it's overweight people who ask me this yeah. question. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, it's a myth that we don't move around as much as traditional people. They actually have done time and motion studies of Australian Aborigines. And boy, there was a lot of sitting around in those cultures. You know, they moved and exercised when they had to, to hunt or gather food. But the rest of the time was they weren't out jogging or going to the gym, they sat around. And they found that uh, modern people living in cities actually walked more and moved more than the um, traditional cultures. Uh, one of the things about this diet is that it's satisfying. And when you eat a meal based on this type of food, uh, you find that you don't get hungry between meals. That, um, and that's what kills your diet is hunger, right? So when your body is getting everything it needs, it's not telling you I'm hungry all the time. Now, I'm not saying that you will lose weight on this diet. I don't think you'll gain weight, but we do have some suggestions if you need to lose weight. And I have an article called Thoughts on Weight Loss, which you can find at westonaprice.org. We do recommend what we call intermittent fasting, where you skip one meal a day, either breakfast or dinner. 
So you go for at least 18 hours without food. And once you go past 12 hours without food, uh, your body starts to send uh, signals to burn, burn your fat. So you still have two delicious, healthy, satisfying meals that um, keep you from being hungry. But if you skip a meal a day, you're ending up eating less. Okay, well, that's, that's really good information and thank you for answering that. So I wanna thank you again, Sally, for participating in our virtual um, nutrition education classes. We are offering these classes every through the fall, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Thank you.